speaker this evening, Mr. Joseph L. Curtis. I'm not much for one to stand in front of a microphone, so I'll, so I'll speak up pretty well because uh, I tend to move around a bit. Um, thank you very much for the honor of asking me to speak with you tonight. Uh, when it comes to Comstock history, I'm kind of in a mode of if you'll talk about it, I'll talk as long as you'll stand there. <laughs> um, you know, I'll go on and on. And taking from a little comment that uh, Charlie Siebenthal mentioned this morning in, in his presentation. Um, I, I'm using, I'm coining a new phrase that I'm going to be using and probably quite often, that, that I'm going to be in Charlie mode. And to me, that'll be that I'm using slides to remind me of what it is I've got to say. So, so I'll always be thinking when I do a presentation, I'll always be thinking about Charlie. <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> is he close? And, um, <laughs> I, yes, I, uh, I probably, uh, I know that there's those of you up there uh, that I've known in one way or another over the years, either through the bookstore or through the connection with, with my parents. And uh, I find that comforting because um, so many of you are really, you know, you're the hardcore railroad people and Ron Allen and stuff. And, uh, you know, I've known these guys most of my life. And... Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a fun place to be. It's, uh, and I get to see some people that I haven't seen for a while. And, and, and Stephen Drew and I go way back, of course, with the family and so forth. But what he would ask me to speak to you about tonight was some history regarding, regarding Virginia City and regarding the Great Fire and how it relates to the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. And it does relate to the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. But I, I need to paint a picture for you in advance in order to be able to, for you to have a better <coughs> understanding of, of what happened with the great fire that we refer to of, of October 26, um, 1875. And I'm sure most of you uh, probably know or heard of the great fire of Virginia City. Is that pretty much true? Yep. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so it's not brand new information. So if I, the problem with that though is that if I skip over something, somebody will probably go, hey, you, you forgot about this. <laughs> but, but that's okay. Uh, that's, that's, that's all right. If, if Charlie raises his hand, I won't ask him to call him. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, that's a, when, I saw, when I saw Charlie's name on the, on the roster thing, the, of the, of the thing, I go, oh, I know that name from way back. You know, and, uh, and, and I thought, well, that'll be fun. To, uh, I know that. Uh, that's a you can't thing. hear me back here, young man. You can't. You can't hear me back there. Yeah. 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 We don't have. We don't have. Does this work? Does this yeah, work? Does this work? Button. Turn it on. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> got the walk around yeah. over there. Yeah, we got we got the wrapper on. If you want to do it Is it on? Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Okay, that'll work. That's much better. Can you hear me now? Yeah. You didn't. You didn't miss anything before, so <laughs> just, don't worry about it. Um, my long lost brother apparently is back there, and yeah, Bill. <laughs> no, really, but he was wondering. He, I think he was looking for a place to stay tonight. But <laughs> um, so, so let's let's get into talking about the the Great Fire of uh, October 26, 1875, and before I do, I have to give. A little note to my sponsor, if you will, and that's the Virginia City or the Comstock Firemen's Museum, which uh, former uh, state governor, uh, um, Senator Bryan, or went on to be Senator Bryan, uh, actually gave us the title of the Nevada State Fire Muse Museum or Firemen's Museum. On no budget, of course, you know, sort of like the Railroad Museum, you know, <laughs> no budget, but, uh, but that's, we got that fancy title. If you ever get up to Virginia City and you want to stop by the Fireman's Museum, whether it's open or not, feel free to call me and I'll come up and open it for you. Uh, because we're not open from November 1st through about May 1st as a rule, because there's just not enough people around. At any rate, we're going to talk about fire. And we're going to talk about initially the, the major fires that were preceding the Great Fire. Now, 
First off, in 1859, the first fire that struck Virginia City in 1859, and of course 1859 is really the beginning of Virginia City, if you will, was a uh, fire that occurred in a small shack as a result of a stove that tipped over, and this uh, shack caught on fire, and there was no way to put this fire out. There was no fire department at that time. There was nobody that thought about the, the need to have to put a fire out. And it was um, uh, in the winter, so there was plenty of snow on the ground, as there quite often is in Virginia City. So they chose to throw snowballs at it until they put the fire out. It worked. So now we sell a t-shirt in Virginia in the Fire Museum that says Virginia City Volunteer Fire Department putting snow putting fires out with snowballs since 1859. <laughs> and they, we sell them like pancakes, so it, it worked out pretty good. The most serious fires that, that Virginia City has had over the over the long haul uh, occurred primarily from 1859 through 19 about 1942. Uh, the last major conflagration in Virginia City was in 1942, which was known as the Divide Fire, uh, November 11th of 1942. And it, it destroyed um, about 40 structures on the Divide, which is the area that, that is between, on the top of the hill where the DOT yard is, if you know where that is, that is kind of the difference between Virginia City and Gold Hill. That particular area is also uh, historically known as Middletown. And um, I'm, I'm one to put in some of these little phrases in, in these articles that I write for the paper. And incidentally, the CL, you, you, I, I call it years ago, to kind of hide the word years ago. But um, if you think about it, the, what's the C stand for? One hundred, no, 100. No, and that's not my age either. C stands for 100. What's L stand for? So it's 150 years ago. <laughs> and nobody ever gets it, you know. Unfortunately, everybody knows who it is now. It was okay for a while. But... This is a, a brief picture of Rosenbaum's store. Um, this is on C Street. This was about the middle of C Street, uh, roughly say maybe if you're familiar with um, uh, where Red's Candies is or kind of on a little bit to the south of the Delta. Uh, and uh, it, it burned in the uh, late 60s. And it was one of the more serious fires in town that has the po had the potential of becoming catastrophic in nature. Another one was a fire in about 1870 that was somewhat catastrophic, destroyed several buildings. And this here also is in that same general location. Uh, this is actually the, uh, the building uh, that is, houses now uh, Red's Candies in Virginia City. And um, that was another major situation. Now this, this is, and, uh, this is gonna tie into something I'm gonna tell you about a little bit later, but if you notice this particular piece of fire equipment, this is called, this is a hose wagon. And we'll talk about that later. But this is a uh, this was called the Divide Hose Company. The Divide Hose Company was located on the far south end on the Divide, basically where the DOT yard is now. 1859-1873, there was poor firefighting equipment during that that initial period of time. Uh, it, we had inadequate water flow uh, capabilities at that time. Uh, the water wasn't piped in until roughly 1873 uh, by uh, Mackie and the boys uh, bringing water in. Uh, equipment was very heavy, very heavy. The, the average piece of equipment, something like, like this, this piece of equipment that we look at back here, uh, that's probably, oh, probably weighs four or five hundred pounds maybe. Uh, but you got, we've got other equipment that weighs as much as uh, 6,000 pounds, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But the equipment was very heavy. Uh, it was hand-pulled by any number of, of men or horses. That, uh, and the horses were, interestingly enough, if you had horses that pulled a certain piece of equipment, those horses were kept inside the fire station, of course, 
And they were trained to such a point that when a bell went off signaling a fire, those horses would come out of their stalls and they would walk over and stand in front of the piece of fire equipment. And there was, it was, a, there was a system that the fireman, all he had to do was go and yank a lanyard and there were the, you know, the horse collars that they put over around the neck. These horse collars were, were, were they folded out and when it hit the neck, it snapped together and would snap together. And these horses knew right where to stand. He pulled this ant lanyard and over the two horses neck and they would snap together and they're out the door. So um, the, uh, the weight of the equipment is, you know, think about this, is oh, some of them over 3,000 pounds. And, and we have another piece of equipment that uh, according to um, first-hand reports of uh, Jack Greenhall is uh, 6,400, Jack, is that right? Jack, can you, you get your hearing aid turned up? <laughs> oh, okay. okay. All right. That's correct, right? 6,400 pounds? Yep. Okay. My Subaru weighs 6,575 pounds. So when you think about having to pull that Subaru by hand with a rope, several people helping you make probably, well, definitely, uh, probably maybe upwards to 25, 30 people, pulling that Subaru from Gold Hill, up the hill, and over the top, and into Virginia City. And that's what they had to do to get this equipment to a fire. And you're at 6,000 foot altitude. You know, if you're in Carson, that's a little better at 4,000. But it's, you know, you see these people at 6,000 foot altitude, that requires a lot of huffing and puffing. That's, that's, that's difficult to, to get the, get your wind at that. So uh, there was numbers of pieces of equipment that would come from, from Gold Hill to get up to Virginia City. These guys obviously were spent when they got to the fire. And uh, you know now you jump on a nice truck and you get a nice quiet ride, not, well not quiet, but you get a nice ride to the fire and you're putting on your equipment and you're all ready to go when you get there. And these guys, were in the, probably the kind of clothes that we're wearing basically now, shirt and coat and tie, or maybe if that was the case, or, or you know, just regular pants type Levi's and what have you. And they're, they're doing this with nothing else, with no fancy equipment on. So, so with the weight of these things, uh, uh, the Knickerbocker, which you, you'll see uh, this one particular piece of equipment here in a minute, uh, it weighed over 3,000 pounds, and it takes about 25 or 30 men to pull that, uh, even on a pretty level street. And, and of course, there are not many of those in Virginia City. Level streets are at a premium. The um, um, think about having to pull that up in one of those situations. So, this is the Knickerbocker. This is a. This is called an engine because it pumps water. And what happens is these arms here on each side, they fold down and you get about 12 or 14 men or whomever you can con into it to stand on each side, grab a hold of this thing and pump it up and down. And th this is actually a functional piece of equipment. It's one of our fourth out engines in Virginia City. We um, uh, can pull it out, and we've pumped it in years past. It's totally rebuilt. Uh, Jack Greenhall and I both have been involved over the years in restoring a lot of this equipment, and uh, it, uh, it's fully functional. So you, you, these things are pumping back and forth, and when you do that, you get to pumping that so hard, it, it's what we call dances. The wheels actually have come off of the ground just a little bit, and it bounces from side to side. It's referred to as dancing, uh, historically speaking. This is pumps water. Okay, where do we get the water? We get it from one of two locations. We either get it from a hydrant system, which after 1873, the we had a hydrant system within the community, where uh, and that water comes down from uh, Marlette Lake, the Hobart Reservoir, and it comes from the 7,200 foot level down to Washoe Valley, 4,000 foot level roughly, and then back up 
to about the 58 or, or 6,000 foot level, and then a little bit further up to 62 or 64, and then it drops back down into the community at the 62, uh, 6,000 foot level. When it does that, the water pressure on the main street or C street of Virginia City, the water pressure is on C street average as much as 150 to 175 pounds per square inch. Now by comparison, the water pressure for a fire hydrant in San Francisco is 65 pounds per square inch. So we use fire engines up there to dampen the pressure down as opposed to pump it up. Um, and if you get down by the high school, you know, from C Street and you go down to R Street and, you know, do the math, uh, however many numbers that is, and, and uh, uh, when you get down by the high school on R Street, the pressure can be over 200, 200 up, upwards of 250 pounds. We have to put fire hydrants in concrete in order to keep them from actually pushing themselves out of the ground at times. Now it's better because we've got pressure regulators on a lot of the lines. So the, the, um, the, the first lines that came in that would have been used for the Great Fire were about 18 inches, and, and that was in 1873. And then in, and just before the fire, a second line was brought in. After the fire, a third line was brought in. So there was quite a bit of water that was available um, on, on the... On the uh, um, Comstock for fires at that time. The other way that it, that thing got water was using cisterns. And the cisterns were in the streets, under the streets, and they, they, would, they would house several thousand gallons of water. We just found one of those cisterns uh, here in the last oh, a month, probably. Uh, we're in a process of building a whole new sewer system throughout the entire city, community. <clears throat> and uh, and doing the ground penetration radar for for locating things, they found one of these cisterns up on D Street, and now they're all worried about whether it's going to cars can drive over it and so forth. You know, they've been driving over it for God knows how long, so <laughs> it should be okay. <laughs> I don't drive anymore, but. <laughs> So, so the water pressures uh, are, are fantastic up there. So what are the factors that came into play in relationship to causing this, this uh, great fire to, to occur, or to, to be able to create the kind of destruction that it did? The great fire of October 26, 1875, there's no pictures of that I have ever seen or ever heard of, um, ever, you know, and I've, I've tried to find this stuff any place and every place. There's one or two um, articles that were written about it, but if anybody in here has ever seen or knows where, there is a photograph taken immediately after the Great Fire, within a, two or three days. I, one, either pay great money for it, or as long as, well, I, uh, my wife's here, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, or, or, you know, I'd love the opportunity to see it. So if you have one, raise your hand. Charlie, you have one? No? He was there. He went out there. That's true. <laughs> so he didn't need a photograph, right? <laughs> um, so it's always made me wonder. You know, there's minimal photography. I mean, there's no photography. There's minimal newspaper coverage. Why is there no photographs? Well, what was happening at that time, 1875, in the Comstock? We're, we're, the, we're, in, the, we're in a major uh, upswing of, of things, and, and, and the Comstock is having a significant impact on uh, the, the federal government, taxes and, and so forth, 1875. And I, this is strictly conjecture on my part, another Charlieism, apparently. Um, sorry, I don't, I'm sorry not to pick it on you tonight, Charlie, but you, you're, I was, I see, you're always so fun to do that. But <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like me. I, you'd so, I think um, Stephen mentioned something about age factors, and, and my wife always says, well, let's go to the senior center and have lunch. You know, it's like only $3. And 
but I refuse to admit that I'm old enough to go there, so I don't. At any rate, uh, I, 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 can, I, I, I think that probably what happened is, we, the reason we don't see any photographs is that that would have a potential impact on the stock market, which was a big deal at that time. And um, there, were, there were photographers in Carson, could have been there in a couple of hours. There was photographers in Virginia City that were not burned out, that were not affected by the fire. They could have taken photographs. They could have had people here on the, on the VNT from Sacramento, San Francisco, in a day, day and a half. But there's no photographs out there. So it, I, I'm thinking that there must be some specific reason, or we would have at least one something out there, I'm sure. <clears throat> at any rate, the, the cisterns and hydrants were in place. We had water pressure that was pretty darn good. Uh, it was, um, um, the problem was at that time we were having strong winds, typical Nevada, October. Then uh, um, the height of the population of VC and Gold Hill was, was large at that time. People, a lot of people doing a lot of things. The more people you have, the more fights you have, the more altercations you have in bars and homes and hotels and what have you. Um, you have uh, tents, shacks, uh, boarding houses, uh, mansions, hotels, houses, businesses, uh, and all this sort of thing that are in the community to, to either one, burn, or two, to have problems happen. So the more you have, the more likelihood you have problems with. You have lumber yards, you have stacks of, of uh, uh, wood uh, burnt to burn for, you know, cordwood to burn for <coughs> generating steam to operate the equipment. And some of these mines used as much as 400, 400, cords of wood in a day to generate the steam to operate these mines and or mills. That's a lot of wood, 400 cords a day. I'd like to be the guy that has to load that 400 cords of wood a day. I'd like to be the guy that sold it. Yeah. <laughs> Good point, Rob. Yeah, that's true, yeah. It'd be the guy with the wood yard. Um, so, at the time, we had plenty of fire departments available. There was as many as 17 different volunteer fire departments at the time. There was no paid fire departments like we have today. There were all volunteer functions. They were positioned everywhere from Silver City to Virginia City, and they were well organized and well staffed and well disciplined. Uh, equipment, eh, questionable. They didn't have fancy yellow coats like we have today. <clears throat> they didn't have fancy yellow pants to protect them. They didn't have uh, boots, uh, rubber boots, and so forth. These guys had the shoes that they were wearing when they responded to the fire station. They had whatever hat they happened to normally wear. They had whatever coat that they had available to them at that time. Um, uh, the equipment was not too bad. You've seen a couple of pieces of it. Uh, so it was, it was fairly functional functional, um, and, and uh, but remember this was an, a sophisticated industrial community. This was a, a community that had a significant amount of fancy equipment, fancy pumps, huge pumps for pumping the water out of the mines and dumping it down into the canyon to clear them so that they could function as a, as a mine. They had uh, special uh, crushing equipment in the mills that gave them the opportunity or the ability to crush the ore. <coughs> so frequently, I forget um, somebody, I forget if it was um, Phil or Charlie or, or uh, the other gentleman that, that was mentioning about the crushing capabilities, uh, up to 200 um, ton of ore a day. This took equipment, took power to operate this equipment. So the, these are some of the lists, and I'm not going to read off every one of them, but this is some of the, the volunteer fire departments that existed between Silver City and Virginia City. There were a bunch there, and very often these things, these, each of these departments operated as much as uh, 50 to 100 people within a given volunteer fire department. And remember the population at that time of that whole area from the north end of Virginia City down to Silver City was potentially as much as 22 to 25,000 people. 
um, at, at that height there. So these were companies that had all sorts of equipment uh, and, and various needs, and here's some more. And then Gold Hill had another series of departments. So what's the difference between the equipment? Well, this is a hose wagon, and this means it brings hose to the fire. This is a pumper. It provides water. So it takes the two of them together to be able to function at a fire. Now, if they're not housed together, and they weren't, then it's a problem getting them together to be able to function at a fire. The, the, the pumper has to get there and get to a water source. The hose wagon has to get to either the fire and go back to the pumper, or get to the pumper and then take the hose to the fire. And, and depending upon how you roll the hose on, on the hose wagon, it was a factor as to whether or not you went to the pumper and back to the fire, or to the fire and then back to the pumper. So then you had steamers. And this particular steamer we, um, we, we purchased from a, a guy uh, many years ago and between several of us, including Jack Greenhall back there. Um, and Jack, you still got your hearing aid turned up? Okay. Um, between several of us, this thing is, it was restored. Jack and I took the uh, boiler down to San Francisco thinking we were going to have it restored and so forth. And we're rudely awakened when the guy told us, no, it's no good. You have to buy a brand new one. So we had to do that, but it is fully functional. We usually pump this on the 4th of July, and you have to have some significant skills to be able to steam this thing up. It has to be inspected by the state boiler inspectors. But is there any boiler inspectors in here? <laughs> because we found out the first time we did this that the state boiler inspectors go, hey, it doesn't heat anything, so we don't know anything about it. Um, they had no clue. They just said, well, if you guys say it's okay, I guess it's okay. And um, uh, Jack recently had to go through a different kind of inspection in, down in uh, San Francisco when we took this steamer two weeks ago, I guess it was, down to San Francisco. Not we, Jack, took this thing down to San Francisco at an invite for the 150th anniversary of the San Francisco Fire Department. <laughs> And they did a big, there was three steamers, I think, down there. And apparently ours was the um, show st the show brightest star, apparently. At least Jack told me that. Um, <laughs> so so why, why were there so many departments? Well, there was a lot of competition in the fire service. And that competition had to do with being paid to go put out a fire. And insurance companies would pay for a response to that fire. So if you bought, so if, if you bought fire insurance from company ABC, and you bought fire insurance from company XYZ, you also had an agreement with the fire department as to saying, okay, fire department uh, 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 D, you come to our insured places and put our fire out, and you have an agreement with another fire department. So, so that was problematic that way, and ended up in fights between fire departments, which, in, which ended up in stabbings, uh, and shootings, and beatings, uh, as a fairly regular practice. The, uh, the rivalries were, were, were quite amazing, and one of the problems was these fire departments were made up of cultural, culturally common organ, uh, individuals. So. Uh, much like the military companies, they were pre in Virginia City, the various guard units, you had the Emmett Guard, the Washington Guard, the Sarsfield Guard. For example, the Sarsfield Guard were the Irishmen. And so there was rivalries within those. And the fire departments were made up culturally as well. And most firemen belonged to a, a, a National Guard type of unit. Uh, in fact, Dan, I think, was a member of one of them. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and uh, uh, the, so the ethnic groupings were a significant factor in the ability of these departments to function effectively because of the rivalries that would break out between them. So we know, so we have, we have water, we have a water source, 
We have fire departments that are organized and equipped and disciplined. We have manpower. We have military units that can help out. And uh, most of the fire labs, like I say, were parts of the military. So that's kind of the scene. So now it's Tuesday. It's October in Nevada. It's October 26th. It's 1875. Based on the information that you've seen that they have, it's 5 a.m. Most of us older people are up by that time, but in this case, these, these younger ones, yeah, um, uh, it, it, it's sunrise will not happen for another hour and 20 minutes, 27 minutes. It's dark, the wind is blowing, it's cold, it's probably in the middle to late 30s outside, at least in Virginia City, for sure. It's, um, uh, some you know it's a it's a uh, uh, a day that in, in the night before everybody would go out in the evenings and have a few drinks and who knows how you were feeling the next morning. Um, there may have been some snow on the ground at the time. I don't have any documentation that says whether there was or not. But what happens after October first in Nevada? <laughs> Anything <laughs> usually snow. Nobody's moving around about this time early in the morning, as a rule. There's nobody heading to work extra early. Um, uh, the shifts don't begin until uh, around 7 or 8, so there's not a lot of people up. So, But what few people might be up were out doing one thing or another, whatever they happen to be doing. The fire starts. Fire starts in a small, single-story lodging house. It's up on A Street, which is up behind the courthouse. It is owned by a, a lady who was commonly known as Crazy Kate. Um, no reflection. <laughs> I, know, I noticed Dan patting her shoulder saying, it's okay, dear, it's okay. <laughs> don't, don't go after the speaker. Um, the, um, uh, it, it occurred as a, as a result of a drunken row. Wow which occurred obviously as early as 5 a.m. in the morning, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. Drunken rows in Virginia City at 5 o'clock in the morning are not particularly unusual, even now. <laughs> <laughs> there are some people, hey, I mean, I've been to calls that early in the morning where somebody has fallen off a bar stool because they've been on it so long, I guess. So it's 5.15 a.m the fire alarms go off. And what the fire alarms are at that time are whistles, steam whistles, at the, in the mines and the mills, and it's bells on the churches and on the fire stations. And when those things go off, they are signals of a fire and an unusual thing. For many years, we used an old air raid siren on the top of the courthouse, which still functions today as the noon, noon whistle. And um, we, tell, we tell the tourists that that's, we're testing the tsunami warning. <laughs> the only one that's ever caught me at that was a Japanese lady that goes, I know about tsunami warnings and they don't happen at 6,000 feet. <laughs> oh, uh, yes ma'am. Um, so these sirens go off, the bells go off. The, the sirens are, are sounding, the, the steam whistles are blowing. There's a lot of noise, but when the wind blows, even in, in Carson City or wherever you're from, when the wind blows, if you're not downwind, you may not hear what's, what's going on. So they're not, they may not be hearing it, or they're going, like I have on many occasions, it's cold outside, and it's early, and do I really, and my electric blanket is on, and do I really want to get out and go up the, and they're, I'm sure they're going the same thing. I, the stove's not going on, so, but they have to get out. So you have to think in terms of these, these guys, you know, that, that at that point in time, there's two fire companies that are located within a mere block away of where this fire starts. But this, this, this mentality of, I want to have to rack out at this early time like this. It's cold outside. I don't know where, you know, I, I can't find where I threw my socks last night. Uh, my pants, let's see, well, I think they're over here someplace. And, and, and that's the reality of it. I mean, that still happens today. That's why 
I, my pants are in a certain location and my socks are on top of them. And they've always been, have they not always been in that same location? <laughs> so the, 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 the fire starts, the winds cause this fire to move quickly, real quick. It's moving all over the place. Um, the, the, uh, it begins skipping from building to building faster than anything anybody can do anything about. Uh, everybody has to pull their equipment up from Gold Hill. They have to come out of bed, they have to get to wherever this fire equipment is, and then they have to pull it by hand to where it is they're going that they got to get to that fire. And they're, they're not excited about doing that. Have a question? Or do you have to go to the bathroom or what? Oh, oh okay. In this era, how is the alarm transmitted to the various fire companies, to the whistles, the sirens, the bells? You knew as a volunteer fireman at that era, you knew that if the, if the whistles went off, because the whistles were only used to signify uh, changes of shifts in the, in the mines, in the mills as a rule. If they went off and stayed going off, you knew there was a fire call. If the bells from, at, at five o'clock in the morning from the fire stations were ringing and they keep ringing, you knew there was a fire. And that's, that's the only way you knew. And someone had to get from home to go down and ring that bell. Yeah. How was the information spread or the, the alarm spread to the people who had to do all this? As to where the fire was? Yeah, but I mean, somebody had to turn in an alarm. I mean, today, you had a cell phone, other days, full street box. Uh, what was the system then? You ran to wherever you had to go to ring the bell? or to tell someone at the mine or mill to, to yank the steam, the steam uh, whistle. And, and so it would take time to do that. You may be 5, 10, 15 minutes away from there to be able to accomplish that. The only opportunity, the other options was that if someone saw the fire that was working at the mill, because they worked in 24-hour shifts, if someone was there and saw the red glow or saw the smoke, which had been difficult to do because it's before dark, before light at this time, they would start the, the, the whistles and the, and the bells going. That's the only way you know. And then you come out, get your equipment, and you look to see what's, where's the glow, where's the smoke, and that's where you go. Not unlike today, we get an alarm and it says uh, there's a smoke report in uh, such and such a generalized area. And you get in the engine and you just start looking around to see if you can see maybe where it is because they may not have a report of, it, of an exact location. You know? um, so it, it's, it's not unlike it in that same situation. So everybody has to pull their equipment to wherever this fire is and that takes time. During the course of the fire, they had to move prisoners from one, the courthouse initially, and then another location they had taken these prisoners had to be transported again. That takes manpower away from the firefighters or because law enforcement at that time is like two or three officers and, and there, there just isn't the, the manpower. So it takes manpower away from various locations. The fire consumes the Eagle Engine Company which is in the more central portion of Virginia City at the time. Uh, it burns several other fire stations, monumental station downtown as well. Uh, the residents and the business structures are being lost one after another as fast as it, as fast as it can move forward. And you see this all the time in California. You, if those of you that are from California and those areas, it, that fire moves faster than you can do anything about it. And it, it was, that was the case. And it was just total destruction. So the fire lads, um, had to position and reposition their equipment and when they had to do that they had to break down the hose line take the pumper to wherever there's a water source and, and, and move off over here and get more hose and drag it here and rehook it up so just think of the time factors that had to be involved uh, with moving the equipment and so forth so the territorial enterprise wrote on the 27th that almost instantly the column of fire that was at first seen to arise began to assume the form of a pyramid. The base of this pyramid rapidly extended into the sides of houses in all directions. The glass falling in showers from the windows to give ingress to the flames 
structure after structure burst out in sheets of fire more rapidly than could be counted or noted down. The businesses uh, scurried about. Um, I have uh, reference material where people stood on the tops of their businesses and tried to put fires out on the roofs using, using sand or water uh, and trying to save their businesses. Uh, they were unable to save their homes. R reports of people pulling out things, even like stoves, to save their stove so that they could start another residence someplace else. The wind kept blowing this stuff around, and it, it, it worse and worse. Overwhelming noise. There's men yelling. They're uh, giving directions to one another. There's there's people wailing. There's people hollering at each other. There's dragging and salvaging equipment out. Uh, the noise that's involved with that and the concentration that you're involved in doing that and you're not hearing what else is happening. And all this time, this burning, it's all burning and you can't, you don't have enough water, you don't have enough equipment and, you know, think of the pictures you've seen in, uh, of these fires in California, these wildland fires. That catastrophic fire is what today we still worry about Virginia City because that potential is there and can happen. The fire ultimately consumed nearly 75% of the town. And, and a little bit better picture of that is this, showing you that here's the basic layout of the community and here's this whole section. And this is the major fire, sec or fire uh, business section of the community. This is the Ofer Mill and mine. This is, this is the, the Virginia and Truckee Railroad um, uh, car barn, the freight depot, uh, offices of the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. Uh, all of the important, most important stuff in, the, in Virginia City is located right in there. Major businesses, lumber yards, uh, hardware stores, and what have you. Uh, everything you can think of. Uh, assay offices and, and, and that sort of stuff is all located within there. All lost. It all burns right to the ground. The Ofer mine across the street lost a thousand cords of wood. And remember I said 400 cords a day just to operate the mine. So they lose a thousand. Can you imagine what it must look like? A thousand cords of wood burning? Just even if that was all it was burning. Uh, 400,000 board feet of lumber. That, you know, have you ever seen a lumber yard fire? Or seen pictures of a lumber yard fire? It, it's, it, it's an amazing thing. A million three hundred thousand dollars in losses um, just in two of the buildings that the Consolidated Virginia had. The fire was so hot that, that, that the applied water instantly turns to steam. If you ever noticed on fires, you'll see initially it's like black smoke coming up, and then it turns white. That's because they put water on it and the water turns to steam. That's what you're seeing. It's driven, the, the, the firefighters are, in this case are driven back on every advance they try to make on it. St. Mary's Catholic Church is threatened. Uh, Mackey is implored to do something about the church, and he goes, forget the church, we can rebuild the church, yeah. save the mines. That was, a ta that was the economic basis of the whole Comstock. If the fire got down into the mines, it was over with. And, and it would have a major impact on the whole United States, the whole, the whole nation. Consolidated Virginia mine was saved by doing various things such as putting iron uh, plates over it and then putting sand over it to the depth of about four feet. Um, uh, by 11 a.m. that morning, starts at 5 a.m., remember? 11 a.m., the fires destroyed that whole central portion that we showed you. By 2 a.m., by 2 p.m., excuse me, except for spot fires, the flames had been pretty much extinguished. The, the wind had died down. It had pretty much burned it back on itself. Uh, the efforts to totally extinguish the, 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 the fire lasted all night and into the next morning and, and pretty much for several days with smoldering stuff. The Knickerbocker engine number five, which is which was basically um, looked exactly like that that pumper that I showed you where the arms come down, 
that, that is a Knickerbocker number five. It uh, continued in its efforts and, and it's still in function today. We still have that same piece of equipment in the museum. Uh, 3 a.m., a train shower, uh, uh, I mean, it's a rain, train shower. I love those train showers. Uh, <clears throat> be sure to wear a hard hat. 3 a.m., a, a rain shower uh, assisted in cooling, in cooling the uh, remains. It helped significantly. How often do we get a rain shower in Virginia City? Not often. So was that, I don't know, some kind of serendipitous situation, I guess. The Gold Hill News said simply the ground that the insa insatiate element in all its mad fury could not destroy. Lost in the fire were homes of John Mackey, Judge John Rising, uh, we lost livery stables, county buildings, miners' union hall, grocery stores, Catholic and Episcopal churches, uh, first and third uh, ward, ward schools, Gilligan Mott hardware, Frederick's jewelry, Roos Brothers at clothing. Those of you from California may recognize it as Roos Atkins. That was the founder, Roos, Roos Brothers was the founder and when moved to California and became Roos Atkins. Uh, Magnolia Saloon, the Delta Saloon, the Worlington Saloon, the Assembly Saloon, those weren't major losses. Um, <laughs> the Territorial Enterprise newspaper and the Evening Chronicle. Uh, they went and, and by the next day when they were back in operation in other locations. Uh, all of Chinatown to I Street, which is where I live on I Street. Uh, the Van Teek Depot and their buildings. All of their records up to that point in time are located in that building. All those records were destroyed. Had to be either reconstituted or, or whatever. Um, freight on the, on the loading docks destroyed that you had just had delivered, that you'd been waiting six months for, uh, had just arrived on the Comstock via VNT, destroyed by the fire. Most of the town uh, fire equipment was destroyed even. So that's going to all have to be restored at some point in time. V&T losses were just, were just enormous. All of their structures, uh, the freight, like I say, the, the, the business offices destroyed, the records, the schedules, the time cards. Now, now are, there, are the workers going to be ticked off because their time cards are restored? Well, I had six hours in that day, and you're just going to pay me for four? You know, I, uh, how do you prove that? You don't. Uh, so it affects not just the railroad, but it affects all the workers as well. The, um, all sorts of equipment. The, uh, there's no office depot in the area to be able to run down and, and get some extra pens and pencils. So how do you get those? So who comes to the rescue? The mighty Virginia and Truckee Railroad comes to the rescue. Hey! The recovery was directly associated, the recovery of Virginia City was absolutely directly associated with the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. It would, it would be interesting to contemplate what would have happened had the Virginia and Truckee Railroad not been there to help that happen with bringing upwards, and Steve, Stephen Drew and I were talking earlier today about the um, number of trains that would have come into Virginia City or had the potential to bring freight either from Reno to Carson and then Carson to Virginia City and back again and bringing that stuff up. Lumber to rebuild, equipment to, to build with, everything from nails to hammers to you name it, to pieces of wood. It had to be transported there. Um, and, and it was the Virginia Truckee that did it. Uh, it's stuff that came from San Francisco, food to, pay, to, to feed people, uh, clothing to help the refugees with. The Virginia and Truckee said free rides for anybody that, need, that wants to leave as a refugee and go to Carson uh, and, or when they come back. Uh, so a lot of the freight was free at that time for, for uh, helping with that. So the, and from my standpoint as an emergency management director, I think about the resilience. I have to think constantly about the resiliency of Story County, and uh, and you, or you think about the resiliency of, of Carson City even. What things do you put into place to make sure that you can recover from a major disaster or one thing? Well, when you think about that, they weren't thinking in those terms at that day and age. But the Virginia and Truckee Railway people 
thought about how do we get this back into operation. They might have, you know, that was their bread and butter as well. So it was, it was worth it to them to accomplish that. So this is kind of the, the, the areas that were, that were destroyed, uh, the, the parameters of the area. And so this is, if you think about it, this is, this is pictures from today, that, from, the, you know, from more recent times, that I put into a sepia tone to give that effect and think, this is what you would have been seeing in, uh, if you were off to the side of the Comstock. Huge smoke plumes. And then, you, then you'd have the residue of structures here uh, and, and the nothingness of what was there at one time. A few sticks standing up of a, of a home, of a barn, or what have you. That's what you had the day after the Great Fire. That's what you had the day after the Great Fire. So volunteer help came over from California. Insurance programs that were in place, a lot of them never paid off. They never, they, they which, what's, so, so what's different? Um, <laughs> The hope is I hope there's no insurance salesman in here. Um, the, uh, I should know as I leave if my tires are flat, probably. Uh, the, um, the total volunteer fire department system was doomed to a great...